2021 marks 200 years since the death of Napoleon Bonaparte, the man and the myth have been difficult to separate. And in part one of this two-part special edition of Paris Perspective, to commemorate the bicentenary of his demise, we take a look at Napoleon's rise to power and try and get a sense of the person who conquered Europe, ruling an empire that had not been equaled since the time of the Caesars. Now, today, I'm joined in studio by Dr. Peter Hicks, who's the historian and international affairs officer with the Fondation Napoleon here in Paris. In his last will and testament in April of 1821 on Santa Elena, he declared, I wish my ashes to rest on the banks of the Seine among the people of France whom I have loved so much. Now, Peter, as a youth, he was more or less a Corsican nationalist. He look, was looked upon as racially Italian and then went on to become a French general at the tender age of 24 after four years of the École Militaire. So after those four years, can one really consider Napoleon Bonaparte as a fully-fledged Frenchman? Well, Napoleon's nationality is, is a big question. He, he comes from a part of Corsica which is specific. The coast of Corsica is different from the interior. Now, the coast of Corsica is largely Genoese in its culture, Italian in its feel. Um, and when uh, he, his father, Carlo, it decides that he's... Uh, he, he has a career. Carlo has a career uh, as a lawyer. He's trained in Italy, in Rome. And the family signs up with Pauli. Pauli the Babbo, the, the saviour of Corsica. Now, royalist kind of figure and anti-French. Now, there's a battle at which Pauli loses and is um, sort of... He's expelled from... Corsica. He ends up in Britain, oddly enough. Um, and so the Bonaparte family find themselves becoming supporters of the French. They are they he they abandon their ties to the Babu mm -hmm. and become fully French. Napoleon goes to a French school. Carlo has himself registered as a fully fledged French noble, and that means that Napoleon can go to a school which is French nobles' children. So they take on this French identity, and this is a, a problem in Corsica because there are those who think Corsica is Corsican and those who think Corsica is France. And so this, the, the, those of the coast think of themselves as more French, more international, and. And, uh, and so the family, the, Bo the, Bo the Bonaparte family, have to leave Corsica. They're expelled and they end up in France. And Napoleon's in school in France. All his brothers and sisters are in France. So they're very French. So they've taken, and, they, and he did indeed said he was uh, neither plebeian nor, um, nor, aristocratic, nor, nor aristocratic, but somewhere in between. Well, it was like minor nobility, basically. Well, minor nobility, absolutely. But nib nib nobility nevertheless. Yes. People <laughs> have un have overestimated this idea that he comes from nowhere then there are he's one of the 10 principal families in the uh, in Ajaccio mm. so they're not a, they're not nobody they have they have land and let's talk about um, his uh, four years in the uh, Ecole Militaire uh, he made quite an impression on his superiors uh, uh, in, in quelling a revolt here in Paris uh, in 1795 um, I think that was also an occasion where he showed uh, how ruthless he could be uh, talk us what exactly was the revolt and how did he put it down well what happens is the fall of Robespierre 1794, leads to a political instability. And so all the forces that were sort of waiting in the wings, mm. those notably of uh, the royalist forces, though, though those who thought that maybe France, this, this revolutionary thing was no good. So they're in the wings. And the, the government is now the directory. Yes, okay, there's five men mm. who are looking after running France, and the directory changes every year. It so purges the, itself. Yes, isn't that well, it has it has an automatic re, mm. con, re, re changing of each member of the of of the directory every year. So it's politically relatively unstable itself, um, and so in Paris. A certain number of parts of Paris revolt in favour of the royalists, and Napoleon is not in charge. This is people often they think because they think of Napoleon at the end, they forget that Napoleon at the beginning is under orders. Yes, and he's under orders of Barras, Paul Barras, who's a bit royalist on the edge. I mean, but anyway, he's he's got more of those sens sentiments than he has of the revolution. But anyway, he's the di he's the head director of the five directors, and he. Napoleon, oddly enough, 
happens just to be nearby when the revolt starts happening. He's not actually ordered in advance. He just happens to be wandering through the offices so where he used to work. It was just uh, sliding doors. He just in the right place at the right time. Almost happenstance. happenstance. Yeah. And so the man who supposedly had been asked to quell the revolt was deaf and couldn't, <laughs> receive the, couldn't receive the orders. So they said, oh, well, let's put Bonaparte. He's in the office. Let's get him to do it. And he does. He's quick. He's good. He's doing it on behalf of the government mm. because Napoleon, throughout all of his life, is very interested in order. He doesn't like disorder. We have rep we have reports of him witnessing the massacre of the Swiss guard of Louis the 16th. And he is completely disgusted by this people wandering about with heads on pikes. Not his thing. Yes. So this is uprising. This is disorder. And so he's government soldier. He's ordered to go and deal with it. And he does. And when the first musket shot is fired from the opposing side, he let rip, literally. Yes, well, he sets the cannon very carefully. He's, he's, he's very good at that. Um, he's a military man. You know, that's what military men do. They, uh, this happens to be civilians who are uprising, but it's public, public disorder. It's in a place where they don't have police, so you send in the army. And he sent in grape shot, indeed, which is uh, like the, the musket balls that are put in a, in a bag and shot through the cannon that then disperse. Well, it's absolutely, like, but that's the it's point. It's like a Claymore mine in, in your but, face. But, yeah, uh, but that's the point. You're yeah. trying to get rid of it. This is an uprising. This is not, this is not soldiers. And was it, that was a key moment in his rise, do absolutely. you think? Absolutely, yes, fantastic. And looking to his rise, I mean, only five years after this, or four years indeed, after this uh, quelling of the, this public uh, uprising in Paris, he took the country over in a coup in 1799. Well, there again, there's a slight accident in mm. that respect. But, the, to, but in, bet in between times, he was in Egypt, and Egypt was, if you look at it carefully, a ta catastrophic failure. And he managed to come back, his supporters uh, painted better than it looked, but also coincides with us with uh, terrible finances in France. The economy, indeed, the economy, the economy is, is massive inflation. Yes. And, um, this, and this revolution that he is brought into by other people, planned by other people, he's brought in as the muscle hmm. to provide the force that will allow for political change. And that was indeed like his mandate in his head and those who surrounded and supported him was to finish the unfinished revolution, to bring order to the chaos of the previous well, that's um, an, that's 10 an, years. That's an interesting question. He joins the conspiracy, mm. the, the Brumaire group with CS, and he... He, he could have gone in 1797, which was his great moment of great success mm. after the first Italian campaign, the Fructidor coup of 1797. He doesn't. He says the pear wasn't ripe. Yes. And so he thinks the pear is ripe in 1799. And he uses that direct expression. Yeah, indeed. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, uh, the pear was not ripe. Is, is he publishes it in his own memoirs. Mm. But so I think what when he comes to the uh, 18 Brumaire, 18th of Brumaire, he thinks that he's the man who can deal with it. Quite where his uh, ideas are with respect to the revolution. He's a committed, he's committed to the nation. He's committed to what he thinks is the revolution, but he's also interested in order. And I have to ask you to explain the 18th of Brumaire and the revolutionary calendar just very briefly, if okay. you can. <laughs> well, the French Revolution decided that they would start with year zero and rename all the months and take out all the saints' days because they're a little bit religious. Is that? So uh, they gave the months names that were all related to the, to the, to the, the weather. So Brumaire, obviously, is a bit misty, uh, a muggy, bit misty, yeah. bit, bit musty, muggy and cold. So yeah. we're in November. Uh, Free Mare, of course, is a bit chillier. Yeah. Uh, and so on. <laughs> so th they all relate to the f to the land. Anyway. Okay. Now he he comes to power um, in 1799. He becomes premier or first um, consul of France uh, uh, three years later in 1802. No, 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 no. First consul uh, oh, directly. Uh, oh, sorry. First uh, consul for uh, life in uh, 1802. Yes, of course. Yes, yes, he, so he moves. In, he's been, he was given a ten-year mandate in the beginning, and then no, no, no. 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 But it happens like this. We've got 1800 is when he becomes first consul. Yes. 1802 consul for ten, ten years. Yes. 1803 consul for life. There we are. So that's the timeline. Yeah. So now you're um, with the uh, Fondation Napoleon um, here in Paris. And within your foundation, as it is, you have collected, preserved thousands of Napoleon's letters and correspondence. Now, through these thousands of letters that you have, I'm sure you haven't had time to read all of them, but I'm sure you've had time to read most of them and, the, and the, the more important ones. What type of personality emerges from these letters? Because we're trying to pick apart, you know, the, 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 the propaganda on both sides. Was he tyrannical? Was he a romantic? Did he have a sense of humour? What comes out in his letters? Well, 
romantic. Let's take romantic first of all. Yes, of course he was romantic. His, the big love of his life, Josephine. This uh, our publication took us uh, nearly 20 years to publish the complete correspondence of Napoleon, 42,000 letters almost. So it's huge. It's like, you know, if we were p- publishing uh, Donald Trump's tweets, you know, it would go on forever. <laughs> uh, so anyway, we have um, 42,000 letters and we've included for the first time in a correspondence to Napoleon, the letters to Josephine. Some of them are a little bit raunchy, which mm-hmm. is rather nice for a bit more entertainment than usual. Um, Anyway, he loved and was very romantic, very passionate in this first big relationship. And he says, even on St. Helena, long after Josephine had died, the only one I ever loved. Well, so exactly. this is a, there we go. That's that, there's the romantic. And she, and in, in some ways as well, uh, he liked to look at her. That she, she took the rough, his kind of rush on rough on couth edge of things because she was so much a lady of uh, well, what can you say, a sophisticated well, she, woman of her time. She's a lady of the islands. Mm. She too comes from an island. She comes from out of town, like from Corsica. She comes from Martinique. Mm. Uh, her father, her father's a planter. Uh, she married a. Uh, um, ancien regime general so she has style and sophistication but she's kind of an out- outlier really um she's very spendthrift but they, she, he falls very much in love with her she thinks they're going to have an ancien regime relationship separate beds and everything quite surprised they end up in the same room they, could, they think this is a bit bourgeois indeed and what they, they think, and of course they, they they weren't able to conceive after 13 years mm. and that led for him to ask for an annulment just a very a brief little recap he didn't stay with Josephine all his life and then married into the uh, that's correct the Austrian uh, royal family that's correct I mean he loved Josephine and mm. was and I think honestly it looks he looks like he's being mealy mouthed in 1809 during the annulment but I think basically he did love her but he was he, his job yeah. was the thing he's the other thing I was going to say you, 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 you talked about being tyrannical what I think I would rather say he was tyrannical on himself he was absolutely obsessed with work because work was all about power. He says this himself, I I'm a, I treat power like a violinist treats his instrument. I play it like a violin. And now, trying to get the timeline correct, so he was made um, first consul for life in 1803. Yes, that correct. is the correct date. Yes. So once he became consul for life in 1803, he was declared an emperor then in 1804 with a yes. lavish ceremony in Notre Dame Cathedral. Mm-hmm. There were two crowns, one of which was like a, a golden wreath mm-hmm. of the Caesars. Absolutely. Um, did that not seal his fate with history as a new Caesar and therefore, ergo, tyrannical? Mm. Well, the imagery. P- politics is still going on. I think people often forget that they talk about Napoleon. They, they want him to be this... Uh, man who's running everything. Mm. Napoleon gives that impression himself. He writes his own memoirs sort of saying, I did this, I did that. He's particularly, especially during the consulate, he has to do politics. He has to keep his party on board. And now there's a lot of negotiations which take place in 1803, 1804 around the idea of what Napoleon's going to do. How is he going to continue his regime, consul for life? But what happens if he dies? Yes. You know, so the idea of heredity is important. The son, the son becomes a regime, becomes monarchical. Um, You say he was crowned in Notre Dame. We mustn't forget that he was proclaimed emperor um, six months earlier in May 1804 by the Conseil d'État. So he's already emperor when he goes into the coronation ceremony. So the coronation is really just... It's a religious thing. He Mm. is... But the, Pope, and, the, but the Pope wasn't present. The Pope was present. Was yes, the Pope? Was. But the Pope, I, I thought that he was not cor- crowned. The coronation was not. Uh, you know, the, the the coronation was not blessed by the Pope. Let me no. Let me let me give you the details. It's quite complex. Ah. <laughs> Basically, the Napoleon the, the Napoleonic regime negotiates with the Vatican. Mm. Pius VII decides he wants to come to Paris because he thinks he can renegotiate the Concordat. Concordat. In, uh, recognized the Catholic Church, but didn't give it entire all the things it wanted. So he thought, I can renegotiate the this. Of it. Yeah, I can get back and get back what we had if I just have a chat. So I will leave Rome and come to Paris. First time a Pope ever did that. Big, big moment. Comes to crown Napoleon in Paris, but not crown him because they decide this is an agreement made with the Vatican. They have a negotiation. The document exists still where they note what they agree in the document. And at 
In the agreement for the order of service, Napoleon crowns himself. I learned just recently, oddly enough, the um, the family of the great, the Grand Frederick, mm. um, in uh, a, a regime that began in the early 18th century in Prussia. They also had the tradition of self crowning. So it's not it's not unique. But so, it, so wasn't there, there indeed there were allusions to Caesar and of course Charlemagne with the other crown? Wasn't yes, of that, course. That, yes, that was and, the... uh, and Charlemagne, of course, was crowned by the Pope. Yeah. Charlemagne went to Rome. Yeah, Charlemagne, Holy did Roman Empire, Emperor, but had nothing to do. <laughs> Yes, being holy he, or Roman. <laughs> no, well, indeed. Well, he went to Rome to be crowned. Yeah. And so, but the Pope comes to Paris for this ceremony. He blesses the, 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 that picture and David's picture of the, of the coronation. Yes. The Pope is blessing Napoleon, as was the original version of that picture as Napoleon crowning himself. I think Napoleon decided didn't look good, or there was a lot of publicity about it, which kind of was misinterpreting the gesture. He believed that no one had the right to do it. He got the crown. He says this later in St. Helena, yeah. found the crown in the gutter, put it on my own head. Let anybody try and take it off me. Yes. You know, and, and he's not wrong. And he's not wrong. And he's, but, you know, it's a different. And in, 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 well, then indeed, uh, the, the interpretation, he said, sending out the wrong message. Um, how has, for example, the interpretation of, uh, well, let's just say the dictator dictators of the 20th century, such as Mussolini and Hitler himself, who, when he was here in Paris, he visited the tomb in 1940 and said it was one of the most special moments of his life. Mm -hmm. How has their adulation for Napoleon affected Napoleon's legacy? Um, let's just say, looking now, 70, 80 years on from the dictatorships of the 20th century, how was that affected or how did that affect Napoleon and how he was viewed by history? I think that's a very interesting question. I have seen many more people comparing uh, Napoleon to Hitler than Hitler to, to Napoleon. Napoleon. Mm. And so there's there's a kind of, it's a recent recent thing in the general sort of, uh, when we talk about the dictator, we tend to think of the Stalins, the Hitlers, and possibly Mussolini. Mussolini, we know, was a big fan of Napoleon, he actually wrote a, a a play which became a film based on the Hundred Days. So he probably, he probably liked the, the the costumes and the get up more well, than the politics. Well, so who, who knows? I mean, <laughs> Mussolini was obviously a uh, head of state and 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 uh, had and had decision making power. So he was a, clearly a serious individual. But he was interested in the history of Napoleon, and Napoleon has a particular relationship to the history of Italy. So there's a reason for that. Nap Hitler goes. He's more in an idea of the the that. German ambivalence towards Napoleon because Napoleon supposedly in German history uh, humiliates Prussia particularly mm. and Germany um, in uh, at Jena and uh, there the, and this is the idea of fighting against Napoleon that brings about German nationalism and the center of um, and German the German nation the German uh, the empires of which uh, obviously Adolf is the third yes uh, and so I don't think um, that is particularly present. And then, of course, when you try to compare, say, Napoleon with Hitler, they're incomparable. I mean, Hitler was incredibly lazy, never was most annoyed his entourage a lot because he wouldn't he wouldn't get up early enough. He'd rather go off and have a cup of tea than actually answer the telegrams. Indeed. Whereas Napoleon spent his whole time working. So very different characters. And speaking of character as well, when um, looking at uh, uh, the empire and, as you said, then Napoleon's uh, attachment and, and his roots in Italian history, uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, I believe that he said, I can't from the race that founds empires in reference to the Italians, to the Roman Empire mm. itself. And uh, looking again for this new empire that he founded, uh, he also had to create, or he also, it could be argued that Napoleon created a new nobility um, that was like in some ways it made him a much more meritocratic leader in some ways because gone were just the uh, well the, the entitlement of birth now it was if you serve the state well you will be recognized by the state and you will be given titles because of your service to the state so is it, how can one interpret that was that actually a big paradigm shift for the time absolutely i think it was it's called the amalgam and it's the the idea uh, one of um, napoleon's over overarching ideas through the whole of his period was to unify France. When he comes to power as the first consul, France is, is broken up. 
It has, there are people in the Vendée who don't want, still still fighting against the revolution when Napoleon becomes first consul. So he spends a certain amount of time pacifying the interior before then finding himself uh, having to deal with international politics outside. And then uh, his first act, the big act that everybody is very impressed with, is bringing peace to Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all in 1800, then in 1801, then in 1802, with the big piece of Peace of Amiens. Uh, and so there's, uh, there's a sense that he he is the man of consensus, that everybody's coming together. So the things that he does, even though the things that are contested, obviously he puts finance, state finances back in the right place. But this is quite aggressive because it means that people have to suddenly pay taxes and that it's quite harsh that he gets the army working well. But that, on the other hand, brings conscription and conscription is seen as a blood tax. So that what he does on one hand, he it, it, it's kind of it has its negative side on the other. So, yes, it's 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 complex. Mm -hmm.